We'll get started in just one second. Thanks, guys. Talk a little pep talk from yourself. How you guys doing stupid. today? You guys excited to talk to Sean? I know I am. Um, we're just gonna start. I know you've done a lot of projects, man. You've been doing this for a while, but I'm just gonna start right into incorporated just to get it get it into. Um, you know, starting on a show that is taking place in 2074. I mean, what are you? What did you expect when you opened up this script? And was it something that you expected to see, or is it something that was completely uh, different and interesting to you? Uh, I sort of expected it to be completely unexpected. I think yeah. it, there's so many, uh, every single script, I think we got a new script in every week and a half, and I had no idea where it was going to go at any point. So many so many things happen in this world that is obviously, it's wildly different from the one we have, but it's entirely derived from where we're going to go. So, um, so you can understand the foundation and the reasoning behind all the decisions that are there, the technologies that there, that's there, and, um, and, you know, sort of the basis of the world. But other than that, it's so... Um, so difficult to gauge, and the show has so many, so many different plot twists and so many secret motives and lies that um, that I was expecting to not expect anything. You know. Yeah, absolutely, and I think you know that is fascinating. The whole technologies are developed, um, the landscape of the world at this time. Um, I'm sure there was some research and, and some heavy science that went into it. I mean, it's talking about climate change, is about talking about a lot of real problems that we're having right now. You know, crop uh, deprivation and everything like that. I mean. Um, with the writers, have you been communicating a lot with the writers and where they're going with uh, the technology and uh, where they're leading? I'd communicate them with a lot more if they wanted to talk to me. <laughs> uh, I think that they're, they're so busy doing their own thing. No, we talked a lot, and actually, they're, they should be really smug. I think they are really smug because every week or so, I call them back and I go like, "Jesus, you're geniuses! How did you, how did you call this before it happened?" And yeah. uh, and uh, I mean, like uh, Miller, who played my wife on the show, she's great. She emailed me about this Werner Herzog documentary. Um, where a bunch of the technology that we have in the show that I thought was quite far-fetched, mind-reading devices that are sort of attached to your visual cortex or whatever, is already in development. And in 50 years, it could be the thing that we now have in ours. So, and you know, we have some political stuff about walls and we can, couldn't quite imagine that some... In this case, the wall is uh, in, on the can Canadian border, right? Yeah. So that we're trying to get yeah. up there. Which is going to happen, so, yeah, after all that on <laughs> online online stuff. Um, so we like these guys have just hit the nail on the head and gauged it really well as to where as to where we're going and, and it's the easiest thing to do is just to pull it in and use it for the show. Yeah, and in scenes like this, you know, where you have technology that you're interacting with, like body scanners that are going down. I mean, how much of that is actually present? How much of that is practical? And how much are you like having to act? Oh, I'm just standing on like a piece of cardboard. <laughs> there's like I just saw that there's like a lot of scanning in the show. I promise, like people say stuff and do scenes. It's not just like scans going like that all day um uh but uh yeah no actually there's a lot of green screen all the there's a lot of holographic computers and things that um that are just literally plexiglass and i have to sit there and poke away and, yeah. and is that something that you sort of work on is that something that like, as far as your acting uh rehearsal for the scene you're having to you know get the motions just right so that the cgi can be fit to your movement yeah, you know what, it's sort of, you, you break it down with the visual effects guys before, because if I start doing this and that and the other, they're like, there's the budget, there's the budget, there's a budget here, the screen is way too big. Um, so, no, and actually, luckily enough, those uh, those holograms, because they're not real, they don't really fight back, so they're often, often they're easier scenes to do. That's amazing, and, you know, it's produced by a couple names we might know, Ben Affleck and Matt Damon. Just small dudes, yeah, they're just exactly. starting out. Yeah, who are just, they're guys. just starting out, give them a run, they're yeah. really... 
They might get there one they day. They might get there someday. But um, these guys are workhorses, man. I mean, so what does it mean to you as an actor to work on a project associated with these guys? And um, did that help appeal the script to you? Was that? Uh, well, it made it made my life slightly harder because my mum doesn't stop screaming when she sees that and, and the two names next to it. She freaks out. Um, it's like it's obviously the absolute dream. Like I'm, you know, playing a 30 year old American man. I'm a 24 year old Brit. It shouldn't really happen. Luckily, it has. Um, they'll all realize their mistake very soon. But um, but it is yeah, it's an absolute pleasure, and I think they 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 are they are exactly that workhorses, and they care about everything that they do. And this is their first TV show, the drama that they produce. Obviously, they have Project Greenlight, and um, and you can you can tell that the people underneath them and the staff that they have around them are exactly the same work ethic. They have exactly the same mentality, and uh, and they've said some really nice things, and they've helped with the editing and the casting, and and, and so uh, but it's the absolute dream. Yeah, and so why don't you talk a little bit about your character? I mean, you're kind of a double agent. Um, you know, what we know of you so far is you're you're trying to undermine this uh, corporate entity that's um, taking over the green zones uh, and the red zones. So what's it like to play an undercover agent? Is that something that was fun for you? He's, like, infinitely smarter and cooler than I am. Like, I don't think you can... But he... Um... He's really fun to play. I mean, it was really tough. I'm sort of playing two characters on the show, uh, two different ages, two different personas, two different names. Um, but playing Ben, the guy that you see there, I mean, although although he doesn't quite look it, he's meant to be sort of relatively close to the cleanest man possible. Uh, this persona that he's built with this sort of suit of armor and this, you know, just his general demeanor is a little bit too clean, a little bit too sunny. He's very driven, very sharp, very quick, uh, very ambitious. And... Uh, and sort of that's how that's how Aaron, who Ben really is, tries to get away from uh, sort of his secret mission um, to deter sort of and deflect any suspicion. But um, but he's so so complex, uh, and 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 there's always, I mean, it was exhaust. I was I went home exhausted every single day. What we do, I guess, as a job is. Like, you know, we trick our bodies into feeling and believing the things that we need to feel. The problem is, is once our brains turn off that feeling, that's still reverberating around us. We still carry that around with us. And this man lives the most stressful life I've ever seen in existence. Never has so much happened to so few in so little time. I think the 10 episodes happen across 18 days. And, uh, and I mean, he has three life-altering experiences every episode. So I, ne- I nearly had a coronary about four times a week. And, um, and... And, you know, there's just these two internal motions ripping at each other consistently. Ben, Aaron, Laura, Lena, Green, Red, however you want to describe it. But any, he's manipulating and lying to everyone and anyone. So so what I do from here deters from what I say from there and what I show from here. And it, that becomes, that it's a, it takes a lot of mapping and a lot of stress. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you're shooting, you guys shot this in Toronto. I mean, what are you guys doing? Are you... Are you an actor who likes to stay in that in that process, or do you like to sort of cut it up a little bit and allow I yourself? lie to everyone all the time, yeah, and I only wear three-piece suits. Um, no, I spend... Uh, no, the great thing about shooting on location is you know then that you're there for that exact reason, um, and so you're sort of surrounded by it the whole time. I didn't... Uh, none of us really had a lot of time off. We're all in quite a lot, and, and, and luckily enough, a lot of the stories centers around Ben's goals, so when I, when I wasn't doing work on set I was at home prepping or trying to just sleep um but it was great and I've been I was on rain in Toronto the year before so in the same studio my trailer I think was 40 feet away from where I used to work which is crazy um so it was a really enjoyable experience yeah I mean speaking about rain obviously I'm sure a lot of people know you from that show it's so great um you know what was the was the paradox of having to play you know middle ages you know, old world versus this. So that's kind of a jump, you know, to go from uh, past to future so quickly. It is. I think, you know what, actually, the future is a lot easier to play. I think contemporary is a lot easier to do because uh, there's a lot more variety. You're not penned. I don't think you're penned into social and sort of um, the social status as much as you are back in the day. And I think there's just so much more variety nowadays that I think a lot of people find modern movement, modern interaction a lot easier and a lot more natural because that's the world we live in but the moment you go back into period dramas things are more clipped things are more traditional and, and when we're not used to that because we haven't seen it in so long that's why it was the middle ages i don't think yeah. it's 40 years ago i don't think we can really remember off the off the cuff how to how, how to how our demeanor should be so um the future is always easier yeah, because you get to sort of create the future a little bit. You know, once, you know, you've been cast in something like this and, and you've had the character for a little while, are you... Vodka. Yeah. Are you... Uh, <laughs> it's a 
a little stiff, exactly. Yeah, I was a little nervous. Yeah. <laughs> um, that will help. That absolutely. Um, you know, once you've had the character for a little bit, a couple episodes, at what point do you feel like you're starting to take command of the character versus you know, like just reading the words or something like that? How how um, how much do you want to bring in your own sort of take on it? And were the writers pretty open to something like that? Um, yeah, they were always pretty. I mean, I I, was, I spoke with Alex, Ted, and David since since uh, the sorry the two creators in our showrunner Ted Humphrey. Um, Ted Humphreys is uh, and are great, and they they were really open to anything that I had in mind. But really, I sort of entrust. I think there's a relationship between writers and actors. It has to be a compromise. It has to be um, a collaboration. You know, you can't it can't be one way or the other because neither of you can be a dictatorship on this. You know, actors can't just. Say, I know a lot of actors say that. Well, I know best is my character, and you go, okay, yeah, there's an argument for that. But if there wasn't for the creator in the first place, your character wouldn't exist. And then, what meaning do you have? So you can't, you can't just sort of nullify their relevance and their input on this character. And I never assume that I'm smart enough to tell anyone anything. So, so ultimately, they're they're right, and that's kind of how I followed on this one. I think I care about this project so much, and I'm I'm entirely aware of how fortunate I am to be there. So really, it was like, guys, what can I do to make what you do best? work um and there were things you know i try to make people as real as possible i try to make them as empathic as possible and and um and luckily he's not much of a caricature character. a big big characters are always very fun but for me it was about yeah it was about trying to just trying to get into the mindset how he thinks um how he thinks sort of jenna drives a lot of how i then perform obviously and um and because he has to think so damn much and think so quickly that sort of shaped a lot of it but most of the credit has to go to the writers i'm sure yeah, absolutely, and and you also have a, a couple of moments where you have to handle yourself. Uh, there's some physical alter, you know, altercations and some fight scenes, that sort of thing. Is that something you had done before, or something that you started, um, you know, working on once you got the show? There's, there's like you end up picking up different bits and bobs on the show, but I think actually people got a bit tired of me because I got tasered a whole bunch of times on the show. Any time the week was really stressful, it'd be like there's a scene that Sean's getting tasered in now. <laughs> So if you can just roll around on the floor. Um, no, I get beaten up with bricks, axes, guns, tasers. We get all kinds of, like, we did all kinds of crazy stuff on the show, this one. Uh, you do pick them up as you go along, I think. I remember I did a fight scene once in a pyramid in Africa, in the Sahara. And um, and at that point, I was like, okay, what the hell is this? This is ridiculous. No one's taught me how to fight with a sword, and now I'm just flinging this thing around. Um, so, yeah, you pick it up as you go. I didn't train, so I didn't do any theater school stuff, sadly. Uh, you know, when you're acting, getting tasered, are you uh, going on YouTube and watching people getting tasered on uh, a video? A lot of videos of people <laughs> yeah. getting tasered on YouTube. No one helps getting... people on YouTube. It's like this guy's getting stabbed on the subway. It's like, oh, shh, no way, dude. It's like, call an ambulance, do something. Yeah, there's a lot of tasering videos if you need. I've got them all. So your research was a little fun with that one, absolutely. Yeah, fun, I wouldn't say, but yeah, but it was, yeah, I, I've checked it out. So, you know, people who are tuning into the show November 30th, um, what can they expect? Where is this character going to go? I mean, give them a little bit of uh, anticipation here. Um, if you can't stand my face, don't watch it, because he does turn up quite a bit. But um, what can you expect? I guess th there's something in this. I keep on saying this, and it sort of resonates for some reason. I think there's there's something for everyone on this show in the sense that there are a lot of a lot of great powerful characters on the show that all have completely understandable and justified motives um you'll relate to someone within that demographic personally whether it's male female you know social status economic wealth whatever it is or just your alignment with how you treat family and how you protect your cubs or there's a, a lot of it is about family and a lot of it is obviously about love and, and, and espionage but there's a bit of everything a bit a bit of a, a bit of uh, there's a lot of comedy, there's a lot of science fiction stuff, obviously, a lot of drama, a lot of suspense, and hopefully people are terrified when they watch it because it's really, they get into some really dark situations. So um, if, if, you're up, if you're up for just a mishmash of anything and everything, please check it out. That's the worst logline for a show I think <laughs> I, you, could all, ever, all. you could ever do. But um, yeah, there's bits, there's bits for everyone in there, and, and, and uh, if you want to watch a show, you have no idea where it's going to go and how you're going to get out of this one and how you're going to manage to... Uh, yeah, how, how is Ben and anyone else going to pull himself out of this spot? Then uh, then check it out because there's a lot of surprises. That's awesome, man. And uh, let's, let's start a little bit about how you got here. I mean, you grew up in London and you're one of those uh, secret Brit actors that uh, people don't realize you're British, I'm sure, and then you start talking. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, what got you? Did you start in theater? Did you start pretty early or is this something that came later in life? 
I was, um, I was, I couldn't say a word when I was 16. I was bad. I was just bad. I don't think you can be good or bad, but I was bad at it. Um, and I'm sure loads of people that were at my secondary school can vouch for that. Um, no, I, I was doing too many subjects that, uh, that involved pen and paper. Uh, so I was doing history and economics and a bunch of languages because I'm also Spanish. So I was taking all these subjects and I just needed a creative outlet. So I took up drama and like I said, I, I sucked at it. But it was almost the best character I could play. It was an actor that was so bad at acting. And, um, uh, and, uh, and bit by bit, something happened when I was 16 and 18. Between 16 and 18, uh, it just, uh, whether it was a removal of pride or an increase in confidence, I don't know what shift occurred, really. But uh, it became incredibly important to me. And, uh, you know, if I had the same speech every day, I, I, I would have felt it more. I would have said it better. I don't know what it was. But day by day, everything else became unimportant. And, and drama became the only thing that mattered to me. Um, I was doing these school plays. Uh, school plays, as you all know, really suck. Um, and also, you know, there's 60 kids, 15 of them are ill and like snotty, and then like 10 are late and 15 don't even have their scripts, and most of them are just fighting or hanging off the walls. So, like, trying, and also you can say your one line <laughs> that you get three months down the road that you probably screw up anyway. Um, so, I didn't really do them. And then uh, by the time of 16, 17, 18, we were devising a lot of our own pieces and. Um, and it just became something that I was obsessed with. And uh, my agent, who I'm still with now, they, they'd heard something and they came and checked it out and I didn't know they were there. And then they came up after us and did the whole, like, hey, kid, <laughs> you want to... He didn't say that at all. He was English. He just sort of went, like, listen, if, do you want to, you know, if you want a chance to make your passion a career, then then give us a go. And then a month later, I was doing this short film with Tom Hardy and it started. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. How is it like to work with somebody, Tom Hart, like, oh, Tom Hardy so early? Oh, my God. He's He's a big guy. <laughs> He's kind of terrifying, actually. I remember I was sitting. It was like Craig Williams was doing this short movie called Sergeant Slaughter, and um, and uh, it was meant to be the summer movie, but it was England, so there was six feet of snow. Um, and uh, and I was bullying his younger brother in this short movie, and um, and I hadn't met Tom yet, and I knew that I was going to at some point. He was so charming and so lovely. Uh, really charismatic, actually. Like you can really sense his presence from about fourteen thousand miles away. Um, but I was sitting down on the front doorstep outside, um, probably sulking or doing something weird and uh, uh, trying not to die of cold. And I get this poke on the top of my shoulder and I look up and it's t Tom Hardy. Oh. He goes, all right, mate. Yeah, I'm all right. Are you playing Derek? Yeah. Great. See you in a bit. He had a shotgun and an air rifle <laughs> on on his person because he'd been hunting on the farm. Okay. So the first sight I had in this job was Tom Hardy bearing down on me with a shotgun and an air rifle. I was like, okay, this is this is going to be a really fun week. Yeah, you're like, I better get this scene right or else. So it was really great to work with you. It was an absolute <laughs> privilege and a pleasure, and I would ne I would cherish it forever. <laughs> Um, you know, when you're a young kid getting that first talk, you know, from your agent, I mean, are you already dreaming of what roles you want to do? Are you getting to do the roles you want to do or what's in the future for you? Um, hopefully I'm not going to be unemployed. That's the, honestly, the dream, the dream is just to keep on doing it. I don't really have a, there are obviously some projects that I have my, my eye on, some books that I've really cared about that I've read when I was younger and that I'd love to participate in some way. But really, I just think I'm pulling the wool over everyone's eyes anyway. Why not? Why, why try and get cocky? Why not, why not just keep on trying to steal jobs? Um, no, I think as long as I'm working, I'd love to do another series of Incorporated. This, the, you know, if you thought about what kind of roles you'd like to play, this is the perfect role for a young man to play. It's, it's exciting. It's, um, it's passionate. It's uh, complex. It's tricky. It's enjoyable. It's fruitful. It's rewarding. It's, uh, it's all sorts of things. Even though four of those words meant the same thing. Yeah, I will absolutely. Well, they're all good things, so we'll take it. You know, there's something about I love um, what Sci-Fi is doing right now with their original series. It's a whole new rebrand. It's like I, I remember when we were all growing up, it was known for maybe a different, more cheesy product, you know, something. But now it's like really the dramas that they're creating are really interesting. I mean, what's it like to be a part of a network that perhaps you weren't that familiar with before? Or were you pretty aware of their programming? I was aware of Battlestar Galactica actually. My dad, my dad and brother. Uh, uh, science fiction fans from far greater than I am but um well it, it, is, it is really great and at first it's sort of you, you think on paper that this wouldn't be a program that was originally sort of scheduled on sci-fi not because sci-fi is a wonderful network just because they've really started rebrand as you said I think I think something happened when AMC that yeah, I think they used to be the all-american movie channel didn't they 
and when they stopped doing reruns of 16 Candles and started making like Breaking Bad, Walking Dead, Mad Men in, in three, everyone just went, oh my God, what's going on here? So I think everyone, it's sort of, and, there's, and it sort of coincided with a massive influx of talent going to TV. Um, the sci-fi is just, I mean, The Magicians is a great series with a few friends of mine on there and, and The Expanse as well. They're, they've really started, and Killjoys with Hannah is wonderful as well. So uh, yeah, we're lucky to be there, but it's nice to be, nice to be a part of this new, this new shift. Absolutely. And are you are you getting a chance to still do a couple movies here or there? I know you've had a couple great roles in some. So is it something that you still want to do, or are you really enjoying the TV world right now? I, well, it seems like TV is the only thing I've been doing of late. Actually, I tend to fill up most of my year with TV. But um, yeah, sadly, I was going to do this great project in in, uh, in Berlin that didn't really, that just fell through. So um, I might be doing a road trip movie at the beginning of the year, oh, nice. um, which should be really fun. And just try and fill fill the time with whatever whatever it is that seems to fit and that seems to be right. And if that if they'll have me for hopefully another season. Yeah, absolutely. And where would you like to see Ben's character go? Is there something that you sort of, something about his through line that really compels you, something that you're hoping will happen for him that the writers will get, you know, clicked in there? I have no idea where it's going to go solely on the basis that so much happened already and I didn't know. And then once you once you perform it, once you see it through, it all makes so much sense to you and you understand. I mean, throughout the series, what you're going to watch a lot of is, is his loss of humanity. I think that the, it's, a lot of the show is about whether the end justifies the means, the amount of people he has to get out of the way to save a certain number of people. Soon the ratio starts to starts to flip on him. The problem is, is the deeper he gets into this and the further he goes in, he can't pull out. The only way is through, uh, which means more collateral damage, more casualties. And can he sort of spin and juggle all these plates while keeping certain people alive because he doesn't want them to go? And so it's... um. You see across the series a man starting to rip away at everything that he is, and, he, and, by, and by the end he's a totally different human, I think. So it would be interesting to see which which way he goes, because um, you're going to see some really crazy stuff. Um, uh, some stuff that, you, like, you know, at least at the beginning of the series, he's um, he might be lying, he might be manipulating, but he doesn't harm anyone, and he's just trying to do the right thing and save this person that's been sold into sex slavery. I mean, it's an, it's a noble quest to make, and it's an inherently selfless one. It's not for him, it's for her. He's been looking for six years, you know, at, at his own risk. I mean, if he gets caught, he's gone, he's dead. So she doesn't even know he's coming. Uh, and so um, how far does this man have to go? You'll see, but the next season, uh, next season is going to be an interesting one. The dynamic of the whole series is actually going to change because of what happens at the end, so. That's amazing. Well, that's quite the teaser right there. I know we have a couple of questions in the audience uh, right there. Hey, brother, how you doing? Good, how are you? Good, man. Terrified. <laughs> Congrats on the show. It looks awesome. Thank you very um, much. If you could make a appearance as a guest star on another show, what would it be and why? That is a great question. Um, I've thought about this recently because I haven't watched too much TV of late, but if I could... You know what? I said this a lot, and it has, I'm going to give it to Sons of Anarchy. Um... I really, really love that show. I think Kurt Sutter's an unbelievable showrunner. Um, and Charlie Hunnam and the guys on that are really great. And I, I, I learned how to ride a bike for the show, actually, but we didn't get a motorbike in there. So um, apart from some of the staircase stuff. So Sons of Anarchy, just because of the performers. And, um, and I mean, who doesn't want to be a part of a biker gang? Like a little bit, for like a week. Because like the full existence would be probably quite tiring, but for like a little bit, that's exactly what I do, probably. Sons. I'd watch that. Um, next question right there. Uh, hey Sean, um, I was wondering what the audition process or what the audition was like for this show. And uh, so I noticed the rings on your fingers. Do they mean it's very obnoxious? I'm so sorry. There's a few. T I just realized how many there are. Um, there's a lot of rings. Uh, also, Band of Brothers is another answer. One of the best miniseries ever made. Uh, sorry. Uh, so the audition, the audition process. I was. Um, there's this wonderful woman that I keep on mentioning because she's kind of glorious at CBS called Meg Liebman. And, uh, and I'd met Meg and she'd, uh, we'd had conversations about Rain before I'd done Rain and then uh, and some other, we were potentially going to, uh, Narcos was sort of, we were floating around doing a bunch of stuff and we ended up doing Rain and Meg was so great about it. Uh, and uh, and so uh, after I'd finished Rain and I decided I was going to leave, um, she'd rung again and she said that this, this pilot was still floating around that hadn't, they hadn't found their, their Ben. Uh, and my initial reaction was like 30 year old, Ben Larson, probably white, blonde, and blue-eyed. This is this is just going to be a, a, a nightmare to, to try and persuade. But um, but I went in a few times with Suzanne Smith in London, a casting director, and then I got a call from Ted, Alex, and David, the creators. Uh, we talked about it a bit more, what they thought about um, what I could manipulate, what we could change, and I sort of picked their brains a bit. Um, 
all as, as much as a three-way call allows you to do. Um, and I mean, three weeks later, I was in LA, having done a few meetings, I was in LA um, screen testing. So it was all, I mean, it was a relatively quick turnaround. It was probably mid-June, mid-June through to the end of July. Um, and by August, we were shooting the pilot. Uh, and on basis of the rings, <laughs> uh, so uh, luckily enough, I get to travel all over and I like to travel as much as I can when I'm not working. Um, and ever since I was young, I always wore rings. Um, I'm not really sure why. It was just something that I did. And, and it was a way for me. These these are all either from very special people or from special places. And so it's a way for me um, to always carry around where I've been. So instead of collecting postcards or whatever it is, scarves. I don't know why you'd collect scarves. <laughs> the rug collection that you have at home. I, I decided that this was this is a really, uh, this was my way of remembering everywhere I've been and where I'd like to go. So I guess that's it. That's great. Um, last question right there. Hey, Sean. Uh, this series looks amazing, so I can't wait to check it out. So um, I know you mentioned that you were on Rain. So I was wondering, uh, do you find any differences working in a cable series as opposed to a network series? Uh, no, I'm still confused by the definitions, actually, because uh, we just, just TV in it. In English, you'd be like, he's on telly. Um, uh, so I, it's... Uh, 20, you know what, Cable, 22 episodes is an absolute beast to do. Um, and that's what we did over on Rain. And and so you have to commend Adelaide and Megan and uh, and all the guys over there because they work, they work an insane amount of hours uh, per week. And the crew are even more insane. So um, it is it is really tough. And also like a nine-month, nine, ten, ten-and-a-half-month shoot, 22 episodes from like searing hot summer through to minus 30 degrees in the winter is not, is not an easy transition. So uh, that experience was uh, so rewarding, but really tough. Um, we went down to 10 episodes on this on this network show, as you know, um, and it was actually because of the workload. It was actually just as intense. I know it was a lot shorter, but it was um, it was a very tiring, very physically enduring suit and uh, sh uh, shoot. Sorry. And uh, and also I couldn't eat anything because then I'd bust out of that suit. So it was it was a really tough six months. So I can I, they were both rewarding, but uh, but uh, in different ways. Okay, guys, we'll check Sean out on Incorporated November thirtieth on Sci Fi Channel. And one more hand for Sean. And USA, guys. it's on USA as well. Uh, USA, so. yes, there we go.